Uh, so a little introduction from, from myself. So um, my name's Dean Eaton. I am, um, just as I start talking, the pole gets thrown oh, up. sorry, I've done that now, <laughs> so I'll get that out of your way. Hopefully so I'm Dean Eaton, from the, uh, the, the Biosphere Coordinator from the Dublin Bay Biosphere. Um, Dublin Bay is one of the few biospheres that has a capital city at its heart. We have 330,000 people living within the biosphere, and some of them, um, Raph Michael and the likes, are part of that uh, crew that are living within the biosphere, which is fantastic. Um, we're very proud of the biosphere. We have um, some wonderful nature reserves, some really important species. And um, just over my shoulder, there is Cecilia. Um, yeah, bad joke. Um, and behind Cecilia is Dorky Island, uh, which is fantastic. Um, I am going to pass you over to Eleanor. Eleanor is going to tell you a little bit more about what biospheres are all about. So Eleanor, can I throw that over to you? Yes. Are you good? Are you ready? I am going to share my screen, everyone. So hopefully that works. And you can see my screen now. So just to talk a little bit, Dean gave us a nice introduction there to um, the Dublin Bay Biosphere Reserve. But actually, there's a whole world network of biosphere reserves. And Rachel is actually living in one in the Isle of Man as well. Um, so they're organized by UNESCO. So what is a biosphere reserve? Well, to describe it, it always includes a, an, a thing about nature conservation. So the core of a biosphere reserve is about nature conservation, but it's not just about the nature that's there. It also involves the people that live there and how they live their lives, how their livelihoods are, and the kind of culture and heritage that exists in the area too. So that includes all of the businesses, and all of the ways that we use that space, whether that be for recreation and well-being or whether it be for our jobs like farmers or um, fishermen or, or I was saying fishermen because it's relevant to Dublin Bay, but maybe not so much in Kerry because we're in the mountains. There is a link to a YouTube video there that you can find that explains a little bit more about biosphere reserves. So we like to say there are places where nature and culture interact. And we're looking at the, the benefits of having that system in place. So UNESCO stands for, I say UNESCO a lot, so just to explain, it is the United Nations Educational Scientific Cultural Organization. So biosphere reserves have three separate areas. As I said, the core area always has an element of nature conservation. The buffer zone is where we start to see that land being used by people in a way that's environmentally sustainable. And then outside of that, we have the transition area. And that's where we see a lot of our towns and villages, like for example, in Dublin, the, the parts of Dublin city are actually in the transition area. And down here in Kerry, our biggest town is Killarney that's inside the transition zone. So worldwide, there are about 714 biosphere reserves. There are just over 300 between Europe and North America, but in Ireland, we only have two. We've got Dublin Bay over on the East Coast and Kerry down in the Southwest. Now we hope to have a few more join us in the next few years. So hopefully that's something that we see coming online. So where is Dublin Bay Biosphere Reserve? Well, loosely put, it's around this area here. It incorporates, as Dean said, several areas of nature conservation and areas of the city as well. Here's a lovely, lovely map. I love this map actually. I want to do one similar for the Kerry Biosphere Reserve because it shows you a lot of how the land or the areas are used by people as well, which as we said, is really important in the context of Biosphere Reserve because we're not just talking about nature conservation, we're also talking about sustainable development. And so it's really important to look at how the people are operating in the area. So moving on to the Kerry one, we're actually a landlocked Biosphere Reserve. So we're right in the center of Kerry there. And we include areas of the McGillicuddy Reeks, which is Ireland's highest mountain range, and all around Killarney and the beautiful Killarney Lakes as well. So if that's the wrong one, thank you very much. And I'm going to stop sharing now and pass over to Dale, who is going to join us and start talking about hedgehogs today. Boys and girls, yeah, I think we had the birds and bats up from last week, but we're not doing birds and bats today, boys and girls. We're going to do hedgehogs. And we're going to do a little bit of a book for you called Harry the Hedgehog, Will You Be My Friend? But before we get started, my name is Dale and I often come in and out of schools and I teach you about things you could find in your own back garden here in Ireland. But with a funny voice like mine, I know I don't sound like Eleanor at all, do I? And I don't sound like Dean at all. With a funny voice like mine, when I grew up, I grew up in Victoria, which is in Australia. 
And when I was a boy of about 12 years age, the same age my son is at the moment, we'll meet my son later on. He's in a couple of the videos which I've done on hedgehogs when he was wee little. When, my, when I was the age of my son, I used to visit my Nana's house quite often. And every time I visited her house, I used to pick up a book. It was called The Animals of the British Isles and Ireland. Now, it was a very old book. It would have been Same published in 1950s or 50s. There are all these pictures of things like hedgehogs and stoats and all these animals which I'd never seen. And I always wanted to see. Now, I know when I grew up in Australia, I was surrounded by really cool things like kangaroos and possums and all sorts of man things. But I wanted to see some of these animals. And lo and behold, years later, I got the chance to. And I also, every now and again, I get to look after sick and injured ones. And we're going to be talking about looking after sick and injured hedgehogs, as well as later on, I'm going to introduce one of my friends who looks after other sick and injured animals as well. But boys and girls, we will do questions towards the end. Speaking of questions, last week I know we had loads of really, really good ones. This week we're gonna have loads of good ones as well. So it's all good. But boys and girls, I can't get you to read the Harry the Hedgehog book live like this, it's a little bit hard. So instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share one of my screens and I'm gonna put it up on the big screen, and I'm hoping that everybody can see that now. Eleanor and Dean will give me the thumbs up if it's up and running. It's always, always a joy when you're working in Zoom. The story is called Harry the Hedgehog, Will You Be My Friend? And I actually, I wrote this book for my son, Nathan, when he started primary school. So that's back when he was in junior infants. And now he's like you, He's in six, like some of you, he's in sixth class. And next week, like many of you, he'll be returning back to school on Monday. By the way, little hint, when you're turning on the telly after school on Monday afternoon and you're watching a show called News Today, I think the school they're going to feature on the go back is my son's school. It might even make the main news. We'll wait and see. You'll probably get the back of his head. <gasps> He had a forward from an old puppet friend of mine. Now, most of you guys won't remember this puppet friend. Eleanor will. When Eleanor was little, this guy used to be on telly all the time. But I do another thing with another puppet, which some of you guys will remember as well. This guy, uh, he was on telly recently, wasn't he? He was just back for just before Christmas in the build-up and I like. But anyway, he, he was always nasty to me on telly, so we won't go too much into it. To do the story, boys and girls, you had to help me. It's got lots of actions. Are any of you any good at doing actions? Even if you're not, I'll teach you. Harry the Hedgehog woke up and I'm curled himself out of a ball and stretched. We all stretch for me. Oh, oh. Shook the remaining leaves from his spikes. And he poked his little black nose outside of his house of leaves and twigs in the compost heap. He was very hungry. Well, he would be, wouldn't he? Because he's been hyper. Oh, that's right, hibernating. Oh, yummy. <gasps> he began ambling around the garden and he found a gooey snail, which he gobbled up. He continued his rambling and he found a fat caterpillar, which he crunched and he munched. He found a tasty, yummy, slimy schlug schnapp. Harry was full. However, Harry had spent a long, cold winter asleep and he was... Lonely. He wanted a friend to talk to. Whom, boys and girls, is this? It's Billy the Brock, isn't it? A badger. Harry squinted. He looked across the garden and he recognised Billy the badger standing near the garden pond. Billy might be Harry's friend. Billy the badger is known to be rough and gruff, but Harry tried anyways. Funny hedgehog faces for me like that for me. Hello, Barry, I'm Harry the Hedgehog. Will you be my friend? He asked gently. No, Harry, you are too small, and I might squash you, replied Bill in a grumpy voice. You cannot be my friend. It might not be such a good idea, 
to have Billy the Badger as a friend. He is a bit too burly and surly. But Harry had spent a long, cold winter asleep and he was lonely. He wanted a friend to talk to. Home, boys and girls, is this. Oh, that's right. It's a squirrel, but it's a grey squirrel. In Ireland, you've got your own native squirrels. They're red squirrels. Oh. Will you give him a virtual pet for me? Oh. Harry walked under the oak tree and he spotted Sammy the grey squirrel scampering along the garden fence in search of nuts. Sammy might be Harry's friend. Sammy is a bit bossy. But Harry tried anyways. Put a funny hedgehog faces again for me. Harry, Harry, I'm Harry Hedgehog. Will you be my one? He asked timidly. Now, boys and girls, this is where I had to put on a funny voice because remember, Sammy the Grey Squirrel, he's actually from North America. <gasps> no, Harry, you are too slow and you're not able to climb trees. You will never be able to keep up with me replied Sam in a sharp, snappy voice. You cannot be my friend. We thought we finally got rid of him back in January, didn't we? It might not be such a good idea to have Sammy the Squirrel as our friend. He's a bit too but 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 bossy. Poor Harry. He had spent a long cold winter asleep and he was so lonely. Who is this? <gasps> Harry spied the old wooden shed where Freddy the fox was smelling, <sniffs> searching and sniffing the ground. Freddy might be Harry's friend. Freddy the fox is known to be cunning and clever, but Harry tried anyway. Funny hedgehog faces for me, girls and boys. Harry, I'm Harry Hedgehog. Will you be my friend? Asked Harry cautiously. Oh, yes, Harry. I am just about to have my dinner. You could be my friend, Freddy the Fox, were replied with a sly smile. Freddy, snow, he pounce! Run, Harry, run, run like that with little hands up and down in the air for me! Harry, run around the garden, fast legs, and carry away Freddy Fox, a very crappy pass over the grass, cross over my legs, spell off tree, and pass a gun pole with Billy the Badger, and then we don't want again! <laughs> Harry was out of breath. He rested beside a big log heap near the Hawthorne Hedge. Poor Harry. He had spent a long, cold winter asleep, and he was still very lonely. Where could he find a friend who was not too rough, too bossy, or too crafty? He stared longingly through the nettle patch and he saw Holly. Holly was a beautiful hedgehog. Harry was shy, but he tried. Of course he did anyway. <gasps> oh look, Holly is a beautiful hedgehog. Check out all them blonde highlights. <gasps> Hello, Harry. I'm Harry Hedgehog. Will you be my friend? Asked Harry hesitantly. Holly might be Harry's friend. Holly the Hedgehog smiled. Of course, I would love to be your friend, Holly replied in a kind and quiet voice. Harry had spent a long, cold winter sleep, and he was not lonely anymore. Now, Harry and Holly loved to ramble around the garden, past the pond, under the oak tree, and near the garden shed, where they kept a close eye for Freddy the... F -f 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 Fox, that's right. They are happy gobbling up gooey snails, crunching fat caterpillars, and slurping yummy, slimy, sl 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 slugs. Now, I think I told you last week, for those who are with us, that when you go to the library and borrow a book, you can get a fiction book, a story book, or a non-fiction book. And when I first started writing books like this one, I wanted to include both because I also wanted a book of facts. So the book is really about caring for hedgehogs in your garden, making your very own hedgehog hotel, which is called a hiberculum. You try that for the big word for the day for me, hiberculum. I'm going to show you some which I've made a little later on. The do's and don'ts of looking after hedgehogs and a nature detective with all of our different animal tracks, which is kind of cool. Now, boys 
and girls. I'm going to stop that chair. And I'm going to do another chair because you're going to come for a little bit of a trip down memory lane. from some time ago when I did a show with another puppet friend of mine on RTE Junior. His name was Elby the Y Guy. And this, boys and girls, boys and girls linking into the Harry and the Hedgehog story, which joined me this from a couple of years ago when I brought one of my rescue hedgehogs in to meet Elby the Y Guy on RTE Junior. <clears throat> this is my new invention. It's my funny flavour ice tray. I'm doing some new experiments to make some cool new flavours. Then I'm going to ice them up and put them in the different coloured cubes so that I know which is which. And then I can enjoy them in some lovely cool drinks. Now what would be my first flavour I want? <gasps> guys, guys, we, we've a call coming in. Come on, come on, let's have a look. Hi, I'm Alicia, and I have a question for the Why Guy. Why are hedgehogs so spiky? That's a really, really good question. Why are hedgehogs so spiky? Hmm. hmm. I think that this calls for an expert to answer the question. But what kind of a question is it? This is a science and nature question. Science and nature question means we need a science and nature expert. We need Dale! Yay! How are you? How are you? Hi, Hi Dale! Hi. Whoa, have, have you brought a little friend? I have, Elby. Elby, do we have a question? Yes, our question is why are hedgehogs so spiky? Ah, uh, Elby, I thought rather than just telling you, I might show you. This wow. is Scrappy. Scrappy is my little orphan hedgehog who I've Hi, been Scrappy. looking after for some time now. Oh, wow. Hi, Scrappy. Hey, how many spikes does Scrappy now, have? Now, Scrappy has about 5,000 spikes, Elby. And those spikes are just like your hair follicles. They're very spiky. But his hair follicles are hollow in the inside. So if he feels threatened by a predator like a badger or a fox, he can roll into a ball. Just like he's doing now. Just like now. And protect wow. himself from being eaten. Uh, does he carry his food around in his spike stand? No, he doesn't do that, but he does use his spikes for another reason. If it's raining, he can go for a walk and flatten his spikes out, and it acts just like a raincoat uh, to protect him from getting wet. Oh, um, I, I wonder if I flattened my hair, would it work for me? It might, but I still think if it's raining heavy, you might get a bit wet, Elby. <laughs> D Dale, I've always wondered, why do I never see hedgehogs walking around? Good question. Hedgehogs are nocturnal, Elby. Huh? No, not what? That's a big word, isn't it? That means that they come out at night time, whereas you're up during the day most of the time, Elby. Oh. And if you're up at night time, you might see them. But th because they're quite dark, uh, it's dark and they're quite dark in colour, they're very hard to see. Oh, hi, Scrappy. Are you very, very hard to see, Scrappy? Is that so? That's why I never see them walking around. What kind of things would Scrappy eat? Now, Scrappy in the wild likes to eat bugs and slugs, and his favourite food is caterpillars. But people can help hedgehogs in their gardens. They sometimes like eating people's dog food and cat food. Oh, and I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave out some bread and milk for Scrappy. Wow, well, lots of people sometimes leave out bread and milk, but I prefer not to. Dairy mm. products like bread and milk sometimes make hedgehogs very sick. Oh, so you should not leave bread or milk out no, for hedgehogs. No, it's probably not a good idea. Far better is to make an area which will house all the bugs and like, like a big log pile, and as well as being a place for all the bugs to living for food for Scrappy. It could be somewhere for Scrappy to go to sleep in. Um, if, if, if I stayed up all night long in the winter, would I see Scrappy? Well, very unlikely. That's why he has his home for the winter, because he likes to hibernate. Hibernate what? Ah, uh, there's another word. Hibernate means that they crawl into a little ball in the winter and they go to sleep <sighs> to avoid being in the wet and cold and snow. I sometimes I think I'd like to hibernate and I can get all cosy in my bed just like Scrappy. Yeah, I think in the winter that's a nice thing to do as well, Elby. <laughs> Dale, thanks very much for coming in and for bringing Scrappy with Elby, you. Elby, you're very welcome. Bye, Bye now, Elby. Bye, Scrappy. 
gives me a brilliant idea. I think I'm going to make an ice cube out of bugs and slugs and caterpillars as a lovely treat for Scrappy in the summer. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Boys hey, well, that's that fantastic. Was Scrappy I had for a number of years, and just after Scrappy, we got a couple other hedgehogs I had to look after. These two little guys, when they arrived, were literally the size of my hand, and I had to feed them with goat's milk and a syringe, and I also had to help them go to the toilet, which is a bit icky. They were naughty wee little hedgehogs. They used to trash up all their bedding and mess around a lot. I've, they spend most of their days sleeping and eventually they got big enough to go outside for picnics and drink their own milk outside. Are they having a picnic, Nathan? Yeah. And they were messes. They used to nibble on people's toes and all sorts of things. Over him. Yeah, slow open him. Anyway, that's from himself. I don't care, that's from himself. What? It's very sweet. They're having a great explore. I think they'll get an edgy. Who's that machine out? I don't think you'll bite much out of that. Well, they're <laughs> they're both at me now. Yeah. You don't let me at me. The mat me. I want them to bite my shoes though. Do you? What are you trying but to do? But not me. Is that my shoe now? I don't mind if he bites any part of my shoe. <laughs> and eventually, they got big enough to be released out into my garden. And this is their final day with me when they're eating that last meal of dog food before they went off to form their own life in their own. Boys and girls, you've been very, very good. We'll see you again very soon. Oh, and there we are. I think we finished off. I think we're actually in all class. We're in Miss Treadwell's class in Kildorky with another little hedgehog, which I used to have. Her name was Hillary. Now there's an extended story to that, but we'll, um, we'll tell you that another time. Now, boys and girls, I did want to talk about making a hyperculum or a hedgehog hotel. So what I'm going to do, again, we're going to flick up one of these screen shares, but it's slightly different this time. It's not a video. It's going to be a picture. So again, I have to change my settings. This always happens when you throw things and share up to you. Ah, there's a hedgehog uh, hotel or hyperculum I made last year. Um... And if, you, if we have a look, actually, the box, I think it used to have some uh, red wine from somewhere in France, and it was a nice little shape for making the box. But I did something interesting with this little hedgehog hotel. I put a little viewer on top. So I'm going to stop that screen here. I'm going to show you the construction from inside. It's this one. Look at that. Now, our hyperculum has an entrance way. And what's very, very important is that there's a bit of timber all the way up the middle, which only allows the hedgehogs to crawl in and around the outside or into their little nesting zone. So it's to make a little, little spot where they can get into their nest, tuck out of the way of any predators who might try to get in and get them over the winter months. Now, having a hedgehog hotel like that is one thing, but you're not quite finished with it. The funnest job of all is to cover it with sticks. So that's really well protected. So there you go. So there's a hedgehog hotel, but it's covered with sticks. And that also acts as extra insulation to keep our hedgehogs nice and warm over that period where they're in and out of hibernation. I think, I think we might have some questions about that in a moment's time. But boys and girls, I said we're going to do stuff on other mammals as well and almost like last week right on our midway point i'm going to put up another little video and i'm going to do a little bit of commentary through this video this is a brilliant video um if it's not able to be seen that well for whatever reason don't panic because i will have dean and eleanor they'll have the link 
for this video to be able to send out to everybody so you can watch any time you like into the future. Well, I'm gonna make it a bit larger and play it on. But, you know, we've all sorts of different uh, terrestrial mammals. And many of them actually fall into one family. They're called mustelids. Well, now last week, of course, we were talking about bats. And this is insectivores. Hedgehogs are insectivores as well. This is a very small little insectivore called a shrew. And a badger, which is another one of these mustelids. They call them mustelids because they have a um, um, pretty musty odor. And the little shrews have been in two because they're actually competing against another shrew which is coming in from uh, Europe. Now, where I live, there is a large area of the sky which is actually a mining type area, just lots of open ground, and we find lots of are uh, often up and down through now. Um, at this time of year, what you tend to find, you might find is fighting and looking like they're play fighting, and they call it the, the March Hare, Mad March Hares. It's actually more likely to be uh, one of the girl hares fighting off the black. Now, they don't live in burrows the same way that they have a own They've got fossil records up to 12,000 years old. So it's even one of my favourite mammals. When I first moved into the little cottage which I live in, I was doing some extension works because I had to, and I had a little stoat who used to run in and out of all the timbers and all the things which I put down for the building work. Now they call them weasels. We don't really have weasels here in Ireland. There are weasels on in Great Britain and in mainland Europe, but not in Ireland. Those are really, really cool. They can take on prey much, much larger than themselves. Now, they're not Fossil records of them from 12,000 years ago. Now, red squirrels, it's only very recently that I've seen red squirrels in my own garden. Uh, and all the way through the autumn months, I was doing homeschooling and every autumn and, and, and teaching from this laptop. And every now and again, I looked out my window and I'd see a little red squirrel who's been running backwards and forwards from the forestry across the road from me. And he was coming to my garden. He is Fine. I've now got a couple of about 20 years old, so they're starting to bear seeds, but red squirrels seem to like to um, Red squirrels, the numbers have declined markedly over many years, and a lot of this has to do with the introduction of the grey squirrel. But in places like Kalini Hill, which is in the Dublin biosphere, it's done to. Um, that a grey squirrel 
and this has encouraged red squirrel numbers to improve. The other big factor is the emergence of another species of the that pine martin. Now, the pine martin, pine martin catch gray squirrels a lot easier than catch red squirrels, and it's keeping the balance in the face of the whole red squirrel. Nests of squirrels are called plays. They're quite messy actually to come across the day. Lots and lots of not as not as carefully put together as well. Now, in the shoes, only very, very recent guys in my garden as well. They live underneath my deck. And they come out to see worms now they're tiny little things, kind of no bigger than um, And critters are like, for those who are mad people of ancient animals and dinosaurs, probably the first mammals to evolve alongside dinosaurs look very, very thin. thin. Uh, that's why having an area in your garden full of bees is very important. At this time of year, you need to try to tidy up their garden. Bring in some ways we're better off than food, on grass, food sources, or food and so Other animals, and in my case, of course, they live underneath my deck. Otter. Now, otters are another one of the mustelid family. Now, otters can suck their time in water, of course. Semi and they're they related to badgers, and pine martens, and I have a waterway close to me. I don't live very far away from the River Boyne. And unfortunately, part of the River Boyne where it's close to where I live, I find that new water. Not uh, the people who are woodlands, and I don't think we'll probably have But in Kerry and uh, other places in the west of Ireland, waterways are still very, very strong. I was in Sligo, when I was down in Kerry, I was in the Mount I used to do foxes every year. In fact, earlier this year, I was doing a teacher training course and I looked out in the field just in front of me and there were two foxes playing around for about half an hour. And obviously, one was a dog fox, one was a big fox, and they were playing around um, like they were almost a thing. So what was interesting is about 10 minutes into this, Happening now, what that was one of the days where it was snowing, so it was very easy to see them because they were uh against the, the light of the snow. About 10, 10 15 minutes into the end of them, uh, walking around and playing and um, uh, having a good fight, there was another fox, another dog fox, and they both ran away. 
there to find that object. Now, I've never seen a bank vault. Maybe one of you have. If you have, you might send it to on, 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 on the chat and just say that you've seen a bank vault before. and birds of prey and all like that. They um, spend most of the time trying to hide the number to cover of the canals and waterways. Now, some people are saying that they can't hear you very well. The music's a little bit loud and you're a little bit quiet. So. Oh, I'm a little bit quiet. Oh, that's unusual, isn't it? You need to be quiet. Ah, now the music's turned right down. The Pine Martin. Now, it's only very recently I've seen Pine Martins in my own garden, <gasps> which is great because I've got some forestry next door. I actually see them at night time. I, 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 I go out with a special torch and I spot them. But I actually see the glisten of their eyes. Now, pine martens are carnivorous, but they are omnivores. They have a very mixed diet and they eat berries and all sorts of things as well. And pine martens, as we said, we think for one of the reasons, because they're expanding in numbers, is one of the reasons why our red squirrels are improving their numbers as well, because the pine martens are having an effect on the grey squirrel population, so I'm not looking that like that. Great. Now they leave scents everywhere and droppings everywhere. They kind of leave their droppings as a way of marking off their own territory. And they old, use old squirrel drays and things for their own nests. Now we we're talking about bats last week, of course. Bats are the only mammal which can fly. In Ireland, we have about 10 different species of bat. And bats in Ireland are insectivorous. They eat insects, but they need the cover of hedgerows and walls. And they're nocturnal. I think last week somebody asked me the question what, why they were dark in colour and nocturnal and I was suggesting that, that they do that so they don't get predated upon by daytime predators. So they are a creature of the night as the book we read last week was. And I only have one young. We were talking about them falling from their own little colonies where they're all little battlings cuddle together for warmth. <gasps> hedgehogs, and of course we've already talked a lot about the hedgehog, haven't we? Or Grunyog, which I think means little ugly fella. That's a pretty awful thing to call a poor little hedgehog. Now, although they're called porcupines, they're not related to porcupines. They are insectivores. They are the largest of all the insectivores. We'll be talking about them spines a bit later as well. But those spines are actually made up of something called keratin, which is the stuff which is in our fingernails and in our hair. So they're hair follicles, which are hollow on the inside. And that's what protects them from being eaten by other things. When they're little, their spines, their hair follicles aren't quite as hard. That's why you're able to see that I was able to hold on to them. But those spines actually, what they, Eventually, when they're very little, they all fall out and they're replaced by their adult spines, which are a lot thicker. Badger or Brock. Now, badgers are little things called sets where they live together in family groupings. 
when there's family groupings are disturbed by one being killed, or, it, it's very uh, difficult or upsetting for the whole family because they're actually very used to each other. Now, badgers eat earthworms and insects and larvae. They don't really have any natural predators except for us. People have been very cruel to badgers over the years. They are protected here in Ireland. They can live up to 13 years, but normally it's only three to six. They live in these underground sets, yeah. Now, there's a couple of sets in the woodland close to where I live. I should have set up some camera traps one night and see if I can see them there. Wood mouse. Now, I've never seen a wood mouse. Maybe somebody has. They're a bit different than the house mouse. They've got much more rounded ears and really long whiskers. Now they get eaten by most things like foxes and birds of prey and stoats and pine martens. Pretty short lifespan, they will live about 18 to 20 months. Males use ultrasound to attract females. Yeah, But boys and girls, Irish animals are often overlooked, but they're very, very important to us all. They are essential as part of our own, uh, part of our biospheres. They disperse seeds and they are natural pest control. Anyway, I'm going to stop the share for you now. I'm going to come back to you all because it's that time of day where we go through some of our questions. Oh, I've been busy answering lots and lots of questions. That oh, these are already really well, That's very important. Been been sharing. <laughs> um, you know, we'll we'll take it. We've we've a lot of well, a lot of questions there. There's a there's huge interest from um, the the people watching here. So, um, yeah, well, guys, we'll, we'll we'll take a few questions. We'll probably take half a dozen or so because I've got something very very special to show you at the end, which I think oh, Eleanor got to see some of these ones before, and I think I think you really want to see the last things i'm going to show you as well definitely now, i'm going to i'm going to take one from a number of people here uh, brian reed said it uh, i think um uh neve uh there's uh, uh, molly there's a few of them uh, uh, basically saying uh, can we touch hedgehogs can you touch, can we hedgehogs? touch hedgehogs maybe? now you know a wild hedgehog i wouldn't touch um and unless you uh unless you're actually picking up or rescuing it or, or like i wouldn't be touching wild hedgehogs because they're often they come up with often they'll have lots of fleas and things now the fleas which affect hedgehogs don't affect people they don't affect your dogs either they're not they're different species they don't cross over but it pays not to and if you are handling a hedgehog you really want to be wearing gloves um sometimes people come across hedgehogs are like and they might need to move and one of the safe ways to do is just lightly scoop underneath with a, with a spade, don't hurt them, so that you can move them to a safe position all right. But it's best not to handle hedgehogs unless you're a wildlife carer. Probably not a good idea. And to be honest, you saw the hedgehog I was holding when I was with Albie the Y guy. I was wearing a pair of gloves while I was handling him. They were chainsaw gloves. Oh, chainsaw gloves. Wow. And it, and I was wearing those shirts, and it wasn't his spikes I was worried about with Scrappy. Scrappy was a little hedgehog I looked after from the time he was the size of my thumb, and he was always a bit small. He never really got big enough to survive a full winter on his own, hibernating. So I looked after him for a number of years. But Scrappy was Scrappy by name, Scrappy by nature, and he had very sharp teeth as well. 
So another question with, with regards to those hedgehogs. Some, somebody asked here, uh, how long is it before they reach maturity? So how long do they become, before they become adults? And how long do, can they live for? Right. Now, maturity, there's a type of that. That means that's when they're able to have their own little hoglets. So that's about in their second year of second life. Year. Um, now, hedgehogs in the wild, generally, geez, three to six years is about all you get for a poor hedgehog. Their lifespan doesn't go for that long. I had one. Little Scrappy was with me for about eight years. He, he survived. But then again, he had a pretty good life. Because in summer, he, he, he'd he go around outside in a bit of a run I had for him. And in the winter, he got to crawl up in a rabbit hutch inside a shed. So he had a really protected sort of environment. And he, but he was also a famous hedgehog singer. He used to be on RTE all the time. Yeah. yeah. Eleanor, have you got a question there from somebody? Yeah, I do. Actually, there's a lot of people watching in on the Facebook Live there, which is fantastic. Oh, really? And wow. Lydia Green has sent in a question from, on the, the Facebook chat there. How do hedgehogs see in the dark? Ah, how do they see in the dark? Ooh, good question. Good question. They've, um, they've actually got reasonably good eyes. So, but it's not not that they use their eyes that much at night time. Okay, it's not very, but they're using their nose a lot. They're sniffing. They're sniffing things out underneath the cover. So they can see all right, but it's not really like they've got night vision or anything special like that. Cats they're and with their nose and stuff. Right vision. You don't see that with hedgehogs. They're mainly using their nose to sniff at around things. And that's the other thing you often find them to be sniffing around. They won't even know you're there if, if you walk up quietly behind them because they just sniff around. They're more interested in looking for food. <coughs> Thank yes. you for that, though. So um, uh, we've got a question. Um, what are hedgehogs' predators? <gasps> Anything which can. Um, so if, if things like foxes and the like could roll them over, they'll get to their underside and, and try to eat them from under. Badgers can actually chomp them right through. Um, they don't do it often, but they can. Okay, so they have to be careful. Uh, avoiding uh, the badger in the story was a good good idea. Threat the hedgehog. A cars. Fantastic. Uh, the I don't know if you have, have you got another question there from somebody. Yeah, there's there's an interesting. But just to move away from hedgehogs for a second, Dale. This one might throw you a little bit. It's about oh. foxes. So Sean O'Bailock has asked. He, they, he said he never knew that the fox wasn't an indigenous species here. And now do you have any more details about that? When was it introduced? Now, off the top of my head, I don't know when foxes were introduced into Ireland. I could assume that they probably, um, when there was travel backwards and forwards between Great Britain and Ireland in years gone by, they were brought across. But I'd say it was probably even before that. Uh, it might have even come in time of writing. It's all possible. Um, where I know about foxes being introduced, and foxes were introduced to Australia. Um, actually, as a kid, I, I, I had a very different view of foxes from, a, from an Australian viewpoint than, um, than we have here in Ireland. Um, we quite like them because they're one of our native predators. In Australia, we don't like them because they eat everything and they were never there in the first place. Um, so I couldn't tell you when foxes arrived in Ireland. It's, it's interesting, I suppose, because we, we're we so used to having them here. It, even I was thinking, oh, yeah, they're not actually a native species. They did come in from somewhere, which is... Uh, now, again, you'd be, you'd be talking about thousands of years. It's not as yeah. old as a couple of hundred years. They're uh, pretty uh, acclimatized to the environment here, I think. Close to the grey squirrel, which is not from Ireland. But it's only really a hundred years since grey squirrels arrived here in Ireland. It's not that long ago. Yeah. Yeah, I think 102 years or something, is it, Dale? Mm. It's, uh, and uh, the interesting story there is they were a, a wedding present. They were. They were a uh, wedding, wedding, wedding present out at um, um, Strokestown House and Gardens in Roscommon. Yeah, and they spread through most of, our, I think, at least half of Ireland. Um, the grey schools have taken over from the uh, rest schools. And actually, had, we had a question from one of the teachers that, um, about that. I mean, could we get all the grey squirrels together and put them in a, an area and just have them live there? Yeah, It'd be nice, wouldn't it? But a little bit difficult to do that. Um, it's not really... Look, the, there's been all sorts of different methods tried to... Um, um, control grey squirrel numbers from um, um, sort of desexing some and still leaving them there to um, eradication in some ways and, and, and trapping. Um, but none of them have really been that effective. The most effective so far is that the fact that pine martens seem to have been making a comeback. Um, 
I know I used to see grey schools here quite often, and then I started seeing pine martens or evidence of pine martens. And now I don't see any more grey schools. Oh, so the pine martens uh, are pine martens, grey schools. Pine, pine martens find grey schools easy to easy to capture. Oh. Um, <laughs> That's interesting. And eat, uh, where it's a little bit more difficult for them to get the red squirrel. So the pine martens are what seem to be tipping the balance and the. That so we've got an interesting question here from Michael Dolan. I think he's as interesting, interested in bats as you are. And he wants to know, are there any albino bats in Ireland? Oh, good question. Are there any albino bats in Ireland? Maybe you could explain what an albino is. Oh, an albino. Oh, oh, you call it albino. Yes. Albino. An albino bat. Now, an albino bat would be a bat which would have very white colouring and pink eyes. Now, albinos are a, it's, it's, it's a genetic thing. It happens, it happens with lots of different species of mammals every now and again, that um, a baby is born with much lighter skin or white skin and pink eyes. Now, this makes them very, very vulnerable because in the case of bats, remember bats are very dark in color. That's to, uh, so that they're not seen, so they don't get predated upon. Uh, it also means that generally, uh, <coughs> albinos often with the, with the pink eyes, their eyesight isn't that brilliant either. Um, so, yeah, if there ever was an albino bat born, uh, it could happen. It's very unlikely they'd survive that long. Um, you do find albino of some species. That I know there's been you know, albino wallabies and all sorts of things, but generally they live because they're protected and looked after often by people because they we see their colouring so well that's interesting but in the wild albinos um it's not it's not ideal okay Ellen, do you have a question there question. yeah it's just i think we're, we're kind of pushing up to the end of our time as well oh. so i wanted to ask this question because i think it'll be relevant for a lot of people and it's coming from bonnie leonard today um, and definitely relevant to some of the videos you were showing as you were talking about earlier about your hedgehogs that you looked at after at home. So how can you become a wildlife carer? Is there anything that you can do and how do you get experience in that? Very, very good question. I think the best thing to do to become a wildlife carer is to volunteer some time when we're able to again, obviously just at the moment when I'm allowed to go to different places or see different people, but that will all change very soon. I'm delighted you're all heading back to school, or most of you heading back to school on Monday, for those who are still homeschooling. But when you can, is to volunteer your time for uh, organisations who look after uh, wildlife. And that's one of the best ways. Now, your main job will be to clean cages and to clean poo. I know, because when I was little, I used to work for the RSPCA in Victoria, in Australia. I used to ride my push bike there. It used to be 20 kilometers to ride the push bike. And my main job was to clean all the caves and all the poo. That's what I did every day. But that was a great way to get um, experience and to learn how to become a carer from other people who are carers. Because the most important thing about caring is really difficult. When I looked after those baby hedgehogs, each time I've had baby hedgehogs, it's been summer months. It's generally been periods where I didn't have an awful lot of work happening, which was great because the hedgehogs took up my whole life. Literally, they take up my whole day. I've been feeding hedgehogs from dawn to dusk. Um, but I have a friend in the north of Ireland. I'm going to show you a couple of clips she puts up. Her name is Debbie Nelson. She's uh, as an organization, it's called Debbie Doolittle. And she looks after animals all the time. I don't know how she does it. She's absolutely fantastic. So just before we finish off, I've got a couple of little videos of hers I want to put up. A little baby hedgehog with some fox cubs and a pine martin that she was looking after a year or so ago. So, here we go. Where are the hedgehogs? Here they are. And there was just showing that. Can you answer maybe why hedgehogs have spikes? Yes, it's to protect them from being eaten by other things. Because they've got a very, because they're very vulnerable, of course, and they'd be eaten by loads of things. And um, you see from their underside, they're um, like, so it's, it's, it's to protect them. They also flatten them out um, if they're walking in the rain and it almost acts like a coat, so all the water falls off. Uh, Dale, the, this video is far too cute. Now, 
What were the hedgehogs eating in the video there, Dale? Yeah, that was a special little, little, little food source, which, which they had there, which Debbie had brought them in. Um, because no, no, the thing with hedgehogs that's very, very important is that hedgehogs, uh, you should never give them cow's milk. Cow's milk is actually really bad for them. And this is a little uh, fox, uh, fox cub. So the specialist milk. Now, I, I used to, when I had hedgehogs, I used to fill them goat's milk. Um, but that was a specialist mix she had there. And there's, of course, one of Debbie's little fox cubs. Oh, just before it flicks onto anything else on YouTube, we don't watch anything else. Um, and lucky, lucky last, what else did, did Debbie show? Debbie sent me this video itself because it, it's not up there on her YouTube channel. But this is a little pine marten that she had. <laughs> So, so Debbie is looking after these animals. Is there a reason why Debbie's looking after these animals still? Yeah, all, all, all these little hedgehogs, they, the little hedgehogs who lost their mothers, uh, or, so the mothers went around to look after them. Ox cubs, again, mothers were doing uh, maybe doing a little bit of bread. Again, I'm up and thank you because I didn't have a mum and stuff. Debbie, like, I can't hear you, Dale, because of the video, I think. Yeah. He's he's playing with that like um like he's a little kitten. It reminds yeah. me of my little kittens when I first got them playing with all their toys. Uh, they're they're very very like, I think that's what in Irish they call um cat crown, which is um free cat. Well, Dale, I, I have to say, and I'm sad to say, uh despite the fact that we've got a uh, over a hundred questions unanswered. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is the end of the show, unfortunately, for this week. Um, but I, I want to thank you, Dale, for a really interesting presentation. I mean, goodness me, I've learned so much today and I'm sure uh, all the uh, young people at home have as well. Um, so thank you so much. And we're going to be back next week, aren't we? We are. Next week it is oh, pollinators. Oh, oh pollinators. So please. Are there any other pollinators? And butterflies. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, great. And moths and other insects like ladybirds and things like that. Interesting. Uh, and in fact, we, we're going to learn how, just in the background there, we're going to learn how to make insect hotels for solitary bees like Ooh. that. Do we need anything to be able to make those still? Uh, now, either a, a bit of timber or an old can and some sticks of bamboo, but sure, we'll be showing you that next sure, week. I might even um, I might even have a um, how how to do a make thing, which we put up in a similar sort of way that we made something up for the first um, video, which is all on birds and bats. And by the way, for those who missed the birds and bats, I believe it's currently on the Kerry YouTube channel. So I think it's had nearly four hundred hits as well. Well, I think a lot more than that now, Dale. But yeah, so all the all these uh, webinars uh, are going to be uh, shared again uh, live on the Kerry YouTube channel. So if you want to watch back over anything you missed, uh, you'll get that chance. Um, and if you want to tell your friends who missed it, it's going to be available, and that's going to be the, the case for all of them. So we're going to end this webinar. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Dale. What a fantastic webinar! And we'll see you all next week. <laughs>